Another question, in animal models, which of the following is true when comparing HA-coded femoral stems to identical non-HA-coded stems after implantation? I think this is work from Dennis Bobbin, who's done some fabulous work in this area. Uh, and the um, answer here is uh, HA-coded stems have a shorter time to biologic fixation. Remember, HA coding is osteoconductive, not osteoinductive and uh, they are able to uh, integrate uh, faster. Um, and you can go through the other uh, answers to see that they do not apply. What about implant uh, fixation? Uh, very, very important concept. Two types, a cement fixation as well as uh, in-growth or on-growth, which would be considered biologic fixation. The history here, we talked a little bit about the history of cemented fixation. Cementless implants were used throughout the, the 90s um, uh, with uh, varying uh, degrees um, of success uh, and designs. And it was really the AML prosthesis back in 83, which was when I was first coming out into practice uh, with this fully porous coated uh, anatomic medullary locking stem that provided um, uh, a, a long porous surface in direct contact with bone for the potential for ingrowth and ingrowth indeed did occur. Uh, approximately coated stems were developed shortly thereafter and the thought was that well, why use the whole femur up with a fully porous coated stem when you can maybe go to a proximally porous coated stem and save the rest of the femur for a revision. And so then proximally porous coated stems came into existence and the importance of stability uh, occurred to make sure we have implants that were stable so that we could get, in fix, get good fixation. Uh, despite the fact that there appears to be a a difference if you cross the Atlantic between what's best between cemented or uncemented implants. Um, the, uh, in the U.S., uh, if you look at the numbers in the U.S., and this number varies a little bit year to year, but most of the stems, are greater than 90% of total hips in the United States are uncemented uh, at this point. Um, the data, the long-term data be between cement and cemented implants arguably may show some slight advantage to cemented fixation on the femur. Um, however, um, if, you're, if you're a good carpenter, you do a great job with your implant. You can get high success rates with um, uncemented implants. Uh, the, the classification, the door classification here, uh, and we have a picture coming up in a little while, door A, B, and C. Uh, at this point, the, uh, the data um, uh, on A's and B's is that you can use uncemented. In fact, there is data on type C's, um, which was the stovepipe type uh, femur with thinning of the cortices uh, and, a, and a geometry, an internal femoral geometry that doesn't necessarily uh, lend itself to an uncemented uh, implant geometry. But even in the type C, you can get good fixation if you get implant stability. However, if in doubt in a type C femur, cement it um, because you will get good fixation. So question, osteopenia has what effect on the strength of the bone cement interface in comparison to normal bone? Um, the answer here is, uh, is an important one and that is that you get better interdigitation between the cement and the bone due to the fact that you have the osteopenia so you get good penetration and you get improved mechanical integrity. So um, even though it's osteopenic bone you can get very very good fixation uh, using uh, cement. Um, again, we talked about cement. It's, uh, it's a grout producing um, sort of the custom implant between the uh, interstices of the femur and the smooth surfaces of the implant itself. So it interlocks uh, between these two surfaces to give the best possible, the best possible stability for the femoral component. Um, here you see the A, B, and C door femora, both uh, illustrations as well as uh, radiographs. So cemented fixation, the indications are elderly patients where you can get good penetration of the cement in the bone, uh, clearly irradiated bone, and often these are subtle and you have to really press a patient at some point to understand. You may just pick up a radiograph and see clips or something in the pelvis and then ask the question, but always ask the question, uh, whereas the bone growth in uh, potential is limited with uncemented implants and irradiated bone. And also we just discussed this door C type uh, femur. Acetabular component, um, 
uh, as far as cement, uh, I can't remember the last time I cemented a, a acetabular component. Uh, obviously, we use it when we have infections. We use it in uh, unique circumstances with tumors and the like, and sometimes with massive osteolytic cavities where you might want to do a, an allograft and then press fit and cement the component in. But it's a very, very uh, limited uh, indications at this uh, point for cemented acetabular components. Um, I lived through the uh, generations of cement technique. Um, the first generation was hand mixed cement. Second generation, you put in a restrictor. You used a cement gun and you prepared the canal to dry the canal as best as you could and to remove any excess debris. And then the third generation was to, to use some type of uh, technology to reduce cement porosity and to get cement pressurization. So you wanted to not only restrict the canal, clean the canal, wash the canal, dry the canal, but then pressurize uh, the canal. And um, the uh, if done well, cement fixation can give you uh, reliable long-term results um, for your patients uh, on the femoral side. Um, cement fixation is optimized by uh, the following. Uh, decreased porosity in the cement, a uniform two millimeter uh, mantle, a femoral component that protects the cement, a cobalt chrome stiffer stem, uh, the stem being centralized uh, in the femoral, uh, in the cement mantle itself uh, to avoid sharp edges, to have smooth edges, to have absence of mantle defects or bubbles or deficiencies in the cement mantle, and to have proper positioning of the uh, construct in the uh, femoral a canal. So those, you know, those are those are the key ingredients to have an excellent long-term uh, result with fixation. And each of these uh, has been proven with good data in the literature to show that these are the critical aspects of cement fixation. Um, these are just examples of uh, of stems, uh, particularly on the left side for a, a cemented uh, stem. And uh, again, avoiding sharp edges to produce stress concentration is uh, critically important. And here's a stem with a centralizer on it. Uh, the old stems I used to use would have a collar as well as a proximal centralizer as well. But it's easier to see the proximal position of the implant in the proximal cement that is obviously in the distal cement. Um, uh, obviously, this, uh, this would not be a, uh, I would not want to call this one of my x-rays in the, uh, in the recovery room, uh, and here you see a deficiency in the cement mantle distally uh, in zones uh, four or five, and uh, obviously you want to avoid that. You want to have that cement uh, column um, complete. You want to have uh, no areas where there's absence of cement. You'd like the stem to be centralized in the cement mantle itself. Uh, these are the, uh, this is a work by Robert Barrick and uh, Bill Harris on the grading systems. Uh, I went out into practice uh, early in the, uh, again in the 80s and started to use cement uh, frequently and I would grade my mantles and as I got better and better I went from C's and B's to A's. I can tell you that I never got 100% A mantles. It's very difficult to do but they were graded as A, B, and C. A with a complete whiteout, B with a slight radiolucency at the interface and C with radiolucencies are greater than 50%. And D was where there was gross failure of the uh, cementing uh, technique with a, either a large void or a, a, a stem that was touching the uh, internal aspect of the femur. So let's uh, start with uh, un uncemented fixation. And the question is, what is this range of pore size for cementless porous implants to allow for optimal bony ingrowth? Uh, this, these numbers were worked out, uh, again, in the late 80s and early 90s and the answer is five, uh, 50 to 400 microns and this seems to be the op optimal pore size. You want to have pores that are open pores like this and in addition you want to have stability and that will be the next thing that you have to talk about. So you have to have the ability of the pores to let the bone grow into it and then you have to have an implant that's stable to provide good um, long-term fixation. Biologic fixation, uh, you have ingrowth as well as ongrowth. Ingrowth, uh, you have porous surface, and ongrowth, you have a roughened surface. Here they call it a micro divot surface, but you have a surface that has a, usually uh, achieved by a blasting type process where you have small irregularities in the surface that the bone can, that the cement can contour to to provide added uh, fixation. The indications for biologic fixation, 
uh, are um, generally, I use it in most patients, uh, so younger patients might be one, but I use it in most patients where uh, the femoral canal will accept the implant. Older patients with good bone stock, again, at revision total hip arthroplasty. And I think that's probably one of the most important contributions of biologic fixation, and that is in the revision circumstance that you can take a femoral canal that's pretty beat up and uh, bypass the deficiencies and get a good anchored stem, either with proximal but most likely with fully porous coated uh, implants. So cemented femoral stems have a lower success rate in revision arthroplasty. Some of the early data, even Hugh Chandler and others, uh, reported this. Acetabular components, biologic fixation, all, situ all situations ex except poor acetabular bone stock, or again, this issue of irradiated bone. And I think if you look at the, if you really look at the, um, the contributions of uncemented implants, I think the acetabular component has won the day, the uncemented acetabular component, not only in the primary, but particularly in the revision circumstance. When I first went into practice, we would cement um, an acetabular component into a bone, uh, and the rule was don't ever touch the cup, because if you pushed on the cup, it would probably move. And that's because you could not achieve good fixation. Uncemented implants solved that problem by creating a hemisphere, putting the cup in, stabilizing the cup, and getting in growth. It was a remarkable, uh, a remarkable advance. Uh, techniques, uh, press fit technique. You use a slightly larger implant than what was reamed or broached, and it's wedged into position, or a line-to-line -line technique. Uh, where the size of the implant is the same as the brooch and what you've reamed. And uh, uh, oftentimes, if in a line-to-line -line technique, you want the implant to be stable, and you can use uh, two or more screws in the acetabular component to hold it in place. Uh, the press fit technique has worked well for me, either one or two millimeter of press fit, and I generally don't use screws uh, in a primary. Revisions uh, generally always use screws, but if when in doubt, and if you have any, if you have any uh, concern, you have to be clearly honest to yourself. Uh, if you're concerned about the fixation, put the screws in, and uh, not, and don't worry about it. So the optimum pore size, uh, 50 to 400 micron. Um, Preferably, it says here 50 to 150. The porosity is 40 to 50 percent porous. You want very few gaps, uh, and you'd like micromotion uh, less than 150 micron, and you want maximal contact between the cortical bone and the surface of the uh, implant. Uh, what about biologic fixation, the types of coating? Um, the uh, porous coated metallic surfaces allow this ingrowth fixation. You can have fully porous coated uh, here in the lower right or proximally porous coated. The proximally porous coated uh, implant is the workhorse in primaries, and more uh, fully porous coated or distally uh, coated implants are used uh, most frequently in uh, revisions or when the proximal bone is uh, compromised. Um, Biologic fixation, uh, types of coating again. Uh, if you don't have an ingrowth surface, you can have a grit blasted metallic surface, which is an on growth surface. And most of our proximally porous coated implants have uh, some type of a roughened surface distally just to provide additional fixation for the component. And it says all grit blasted stems are extensively coated. The fixation strength is less than that with a porous coating. Uh, necessitating greater surface area of the coating, so that if you are using a grit blast stem, you generally grit blast the entire uh, stem itself. Um, a, a, a coating that has been shown as an osteoconductive agent is hydroxyapatite, and um, two things we found. One is that you get good fixation, and you can also close gaps between the prosthesis and the bone, and again, this was shown uh, in uh, animal work uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. What about the radiographic analysis of, of biologic fixation? And these are things that I, I think are really important. In, in our morning conference, we always discuss these uh, with our residents and our fellows. Um, the signs of a well-fixed cementless femoral component include spot welds, where you have a endosteal surface right up against the, uh, uh, usually it's seen at the end of the porous coating, absence of radiolucent line, Proximal stress shielding, meaning that the uh, 
that the stresses are coming down through the stem and then out through the porous coating to the bone itself. The absence of uh, stem subsidence or movement. Um, and um, also I would add uh, one other and that is a fusiform cortical remodeling you can see. And then oftentimes you don't see a weight-bearing pedestal. You can see an eccentric pedestal or a, a thin wisp of bone at the distal aspect of the stem, but you don't see a weight-bearing uh, thick um, completely a blocking uh, weight-bearing pedestal. The signs of a well-fixed cementless acetabular component, uh, a little more difficult, uh, generally lack of migration, lack of progressive radiolucent lines, and if you look carefully, if you have screws in the implant, a look at the surface between the screw and the bone, and uh, you want to see no evidence of motion there or an expanding radiolucency. What about the complications of implant fixation? Um, aseptic loosening. Um, can be caused from poor initial fixation. Mechanical loss of fixation over time is something that it rarely uh, happens, and mechanical loss of fixation due to particle-induced osteolysis rarely happens if you're using uh, cross-linked polyethylene. Clinical presentation, um, these are I've seen these occur, but I've also seen thigh pain with loose acetabular components and groin pain with loose femoral components. So uh, generally, um, we teach that acetabular is groin and femoral is thigh. Generally, I think that's true, but don't be fooled. Always look carefully. Look carefully at your patient and look carefully at your radiographs. Serial radiographs, I think, are the most important, and you can look and uh, look at very subtle findings. In fact, oftentimes I'll tell a patient that on these films, I know they have pain on these films. I don't have any evidence of, um, of loosening, but uh, I'd like to take another set in 6 to 12 weeks or something and then go from there. And most patients uh, obviously uh, accept that. Complications of implant fixation, stress shielding. Uh, you, get, you do see proximal femoral osteopenia as a result of well-fixed stem. That's a good sign, not a bad sign. Um, and uh, you see these, you can see more stress shielding with stiffer stems, which are larger diameter stems and extensively porous coated stems. But, but remember, uh, Charlie Ang once told us that, you know, he never had a patient coming into the office complaining of proximal osteopenia after a well-fixed, fully porous coated implant. It just doesn't happen, but it does occur radiographically and you can see it. And there's no really no real treatment uh, necessary for it. Complications of uh, implant uh, fixation, intraoperative fractures. This is one that I think you have to be very, very careful with. When you're using an uncemented femoral component, look for, um, uh, look around the uh, orifice of the femur. Make sure your implant is stable. Make sure you don't have a missed crack. If you have a crack and you see it, put a circlage wire around it and deal with it. Acetabular fractures, if these occur, uh, if there are small rim fractures, something, the cup is stable, you're fine. If it's an unstable cup, uh, if you've broken a column, if you've broken a dome, uh, you got to stabilize the fracture and then put the cup in and insert multiple screws to get it to uh, to be stable. The key is uh, implant stability. So um, intraoperative complications, again, fractures can occur with the use of a press fit technique. Obviously, if the implant has stopped and you continue to hit it and it moves again, you've broken the femur. And uh, the treatment uh, of um, of a femur fracture is if it's stable, a surclage wiring and limited weight bearing. Generally, I go for six weeks at this point. If it's unstable, you have to remove the prosthesis, stabilize the fracture, and insert a stem that bypasses the uh, fracture and is, again, stable um, at the time of insertion. And usually that's a, either a modular or fully porous coated uh, implant. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.